Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for watching our candidates discussion for the riding of New Westminster Burnaby. My name is Paul Holden and I'm the President and CEO of the Burnaby Board of Trade. Uh, before we start, I I'd like to take a moment to recognise that we, at least here in the Board of Trade office, are on the traditional homeland of the Hunkameenam and Skahoma speaking people, and we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to hold uh, a meeting on this territory. Uh, as the Chamber of Commerce for Burnaby, the Burnaby Board of Trade stands at, a, at the cross section of where business and community meet. And we work to foster and support a thriving, successful and sustainable community for businesses, employers and, and the citizens of the city. To help the community get to know the local candidates in the federal election better, uh, the Burnaby Board of Trade is holding uh, these discussions for each of the three Burnaby ridings, which are being shared to everybody throughout our community. Uh, we've extended invitations to all the candidates in each riding to participate, and I'm very pleased today to be joined by the following candidates uh, running in the New Westminster and Burnaby riding. We have Kevin Heidi with the People's Party. We have Rosina Jaffa with the Liberal Party, Peter Julian with the New Democratic Party, David MacDonald with the Green Party, and Paige Monroe with the Conservative Party. So thank you everyone for being here and for joining us, uh, for joining us today. So to get to, to kick things off, I'll just go over the guidelines, which you, I know you're all familiar with, but I'll just go over uh, the guidelines again. You need to be given uh, two minutes to provide opening remarks in alphabetical order by last name. Following the opening comments, we'll have a, a question period, uh, giving you a chance to answer questions that have come in through the Burnaby Water Trade membership and based on areas of priority for the Burnaby business community. Um, I'll direct those questions to each candidate and give you up to one minute and 15 seconds to respond. When we get near the end, you'll just see me count down the last five seconds um, in, in that fashion. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, we have a discussion with each person, so as opposed to a debate format. So the candidates have all been asked not to interrupt or to speak over each other's comments. So now that we've covered the, um, the guidelines, it's the time to get the two minutes of opening remarks from each of you. And we'll start with Kevin Heidi representing the People's Party. Kevin, your two minutes begins now. Uh, so basically, the People's Party of Canada, we're trying to kind of reestablish some things like manufacturing in Canada has pretty much almost stagnated, right? Uh, the uh, green, uh, yeah, sorry, um, the green taxes or uh, carbon taxes have the demand dented in the economy. Uh, reducing housing means that less people are buying houses and, are le and as such, the house prices go up because more people, less uh, supply. So, yeah. Um, the other thing is, is we're looking at taking care of our backyard first. You know, healthcare, education, industry, it's all tied together. We want to develop Canada into a more prosperous nation so we can help other nations. We can't help other nations if our backyard is ugly, if it needs work, right? So what we're trying to do is reestablish Canada as a pioneering country. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your comments. And now we come on next to uh, Rosina Jaffa with the Liberal Party. Rosina, your two minutes Thank starts you. now. Okay, thank you. Um, before I actually go into the Liberal Party policy, of, uh, which is very extensive on uh, help for uh, small businesses and what we are going to do to help, including keeping the recovery grant and all that, that we are, that we have. I'm, before I get into that, I want to introduce myself. And I want to tell you a little about my, myself. I am the daughter of immigrant parents who, who grew up um, with businesses. My dad actually owns a restaurant in Toronto. And my great grandfather, paternal grandfather, had a very successful business venture uh, in Colombo before they left Pakistan. As an immigrant, when my dad first came to Canada, he couldn't find a job. He was uh, driving a taxi. He's, <laughs> he uh, did a pizza delivery. We had a catering truck. There was a strawberry cafe. Well, my family has been in business for a long time, or my father's side of the family. 
I just had a chat with my father a couple of days ago about this very, about this very meeting. And he reminded me that, you know, while I may be a lawyer and a social worker now, that I were back, that our roots are in small business, that our, my, my family actually comes from a very business community. And as I said, you know, when we were growing up, we had some successful businesses, we had some unsuccessful businesses, and we learned, we learned to survive, we learned to do what needed to be done, including working night shifts and going at night, that kind of thing. So I wanted to let people know that about me so that they understand that I, uh, that I do understand what it means to have a business of your own and try to make it survive. Thank you, Rosina. Thank you. And next up for the, the two minute uh, opening remarks, uh, I'll invite Peter Julian with the New Democratic Party. Peter, your two minutes starts now. Thanks very much, Paul. And I too would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional and unceded territories of the Hokamina and Squamish speaking peoples. And, uh, and uh, we say that in appreciation today. I, I also want to thank the Burnaby Board of Trade, of which I've been uh, uh, a member, uh, for the opportunity to have this discussion directly with the, the business community. And of course, um, my colleague Jagmeet Singh, Member of Parliament for Burnaby South, and Jim Hansen, who is the candidate in Burnaby North uh, Seymour, are part of a team that is working in the interests of people, but also working in the interests of businesses in the business sector in Burnaby. I just want to flag, during COVID, it was the NDP that was pushing the government to uh, make changes, make uh, clear improvements to the COVID strategy. And particularly it relates to business. So we put in place emergency response benefit that initially was just going to go through employment insurance. We fought for benefits, of course, for, for seniors and students and also people with disabilities. We fought for sick leave. But above all, we fought for the wage subsidy that initially the government was going to put at only 10%. We forced the government in a minority parliament to make that a 75% wage subsidy. And, and as a result of that, preserved many of the jobs in Burnaby. We also fought for the rent subsidy for small businesses. And initially, uh, when that was put out, it was a very poor program. Uh, the NDP kept pushing and pushing. And eventually, we got a program that many businesses in Burnaby were able to use. Now, coming out of COVID, we believe in, in putting in place uh, a strategy for affordable housing, putting in place public universal pharmacare. During this hour, I'll have a chance to talk about how that benefits the business community as well. I thank you for the invitation. Look forward to the conversations and discussions about important, uh, important issues through the course of this hour. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and thanks for coming today. Next up, we have David McDonald with the Green Party. David, your two minutes is going to start now. Thank you, Mr. Holden. My name is David McDonald, and I am the Green Party of Canada candidate in New Westminster, Burnaby. Um, I'm fearful that I'm going to do a disservice uh, to the Burnaby Board of Trade, um, and not because I'm something of a single issue candidate. Uh, my main concern is the climate crisis, but rather because um, the Green Party of Canada's platform is some 101 pages long, uh, I encourage all of the members of the Board of Trade to um, go online, uh, uh, greenparty.ca, and uh, have a look at uh, the uh, um, platform. Um, because in the space of an hour, even if I was the only speaker, I could not get through all of the material um, that uh, uh, Board of Trade members should be aware of. Uh, that's within our platform. Indeed, uh, if I alone spoke for the hour, I don't think I could get, I could really do justice to the seven points uh, that I've been provided with that um, uh, you, Mr. Holden, are going to be asking about. Um, just quickly, off the top, the green, a green government will extend wage and rent subsidies un until COVID-19 pandemic related restrictions are fully lifted. We will hold the small business tax rate at no more than 9%. We will reduce the paperwork burden on small businesses by eliminating duplicative tax filings and red tape, and it goes on. Again, I encourage everyone to have a look at our platform, and thank you for the time. Thank you, David. And now we'll come on to um, our, our final speaker today, 
um, Paige Munro um, from the Conservative Party. Paige, your two minutes starts now. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, thank you to uh, the Burnaby Board of Trade for this invitation and to all the other candidates. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, I am a new and young candidate. I'm really grateful to have been chosen by the Conservative Party to represent them as their candidate for New Westminster Burnaby. Um, this riding is my home. Um, I'm just going to use this opportunity to introduce myself and we can obviously get into the conservative policies as they uh, have been formed to support small businesses and economic growth as that is a major uh, keystone of the party's platform. But myself, um, I spent the first half of my childhood in Burnaby. I went to elementary school and high school in Burnaby. And then I moved with my family to the Queen's Park area of New Westminster and um, spent many happy years there as well. Um, I moved away for university. I studied um, international relations and security. And I wrote uh, my master's dissertation on Canadian foreign policy in Afghanistan, which um, sadly has become quite relevant recently. So I've been following that very closely. And really, um, I was motivated to run as the candidate uh, because I think, you know, young people, it's not good enough to just complain. If you actually want to see change and you want to stand up for local issues, you have to put yourself in the line of fire, take the hard questions, listen to people, and um, really try to honestly and forthrightly represent this community. So it's been uh, my honor to work in that to that end in this campaign. And um, yeah, I really think that we need to have a plan, a real plan to move forward after COVID-19, get small businesses the support they need because they're the backbone of our communities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paige, and thank you to all of you for those, um, those opening remarks. Um, we're gonna come on to our question period now, and I'm gonna go for the first round of questions, or the first question and, and the first round of responses. We'll stick to the same order that we just had for opening remarks, and then I'll be rotating it as we as we get through the questions. So that means, Kevin, you're up first. And the and the first question is, during the pandemic, government support such as the wage, wage subsidy and the commercial rent subsidy have been lifelines for many Burnaby businesses. What are your thoughts on how those programs were rolled out so far? And what should be the future of these and other similar COVID support programs for businesses? Uh, Kevin, you've got a minute and 15 seconds. Well, these programs, the way the government handled COVID they became necessary. Um, there are countries and even some states that didn't even bother locking down. And hence, these programs weren't really needed there, right? Um, so the biggest problem is, is how we deal with COVID. I mean, I would like us just to open up, go back to normal, deal with it as we can. We're going to get waves regardless. And businesses will thrive as they make decisions based on what they want to do with their there's uh, people and customer base that comes to their store. Um, the money is, let's face it, if some, if a business is going to fail, it's going to fail. You know, uh, government money is going to keep, going to be a miracle for that business, right? So the best thing we can do, open up, get back to normal, start living our lives, start developing our communities again. COVID has just been a big, huge um, road bump on that path. So, like I said, these policies became necessary because of how the government handled COVID. Thank you. And uh, next up for, for this question is uh, Rosina. Rosina, you've got a minute and fifteen seconds. Sure. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Since um, the beginning of the COVID nineteen pandemic. We fought for all Canadians, at businesses protecting millions of jobs and putting Canada on the fast track to recovery. But while businesses are ready to open, some, some businesses are ready to open their doors, others are still struggling from the impact of the pandemic. And many businesses at hard hit sectors, such as uh, the tourism sector, are still need help. We're going to extend the uh, recovery hiring program. So our plan is to extend the recovery hiring program, make sure that businesses keep moving forward, 
and keep hiring employees and Canadians can ba get back to work. So the program is going to be stand is going to be stand. As for as the hardest hit sectors, we're going to protect Canada's tourism industry and by temporary wage and employees, wage employment, and so can, uh, to help them get through the winter. And we are going to need to help support businesses as we move forward. Thank you, Rosina. Thank you. And uh, next up, we have uh, Peter. Peter, your minute and 15 seconds starts now. Uh, thanks so much. One of the saddest parts of what has been a very difficult pandemic, uh, aside from the impacts on our frontline healthcare workers and, and the fact that we have lost so many people uh, to COVID, is also the fact that so many small businesses have closed. And that sad moment of turning the key for the last time as you walk away from a business you've given your life to, is something that the NDP was endeavoring to prevent, which is why we forced the wage subsidy, why we forced the rent subsidy, and then improved it after initially it simply didn't meet the needs of Burnaby businesses. Now, moving forward, the government has cut back on all of those supports. And what we would, uh, what we have put forward, what Chuck Meet Singh has put forward, is rather uh, that we ensure that there are no abuses in the program. Some companies, only some, have used it for dividends and stock buybacks and executive bonuses. And the supports that are going in for COVID for small businesses need to be continued in a way that is uh, ensuring that those small businesses can survive and the economic benefits can survive. So we believe uh, we should be getting the money back for the, used for bonuses and used for dividends and ensuring that small businesses can continue to rely on that support. Thank you, Peter. Next up, we have David. David, your minute and 15 seconds is uh, up and running now. Thank you. I had to switch to headphones because um, there's a lawnmower going outside. Um, COVID-19 pandemic restrictions significantly impacted small business, leading to business closures, debt burdens, and loss of jobs. The Liberal government is ending the financial support for small businesses, including Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, or CEWS, and Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy, or CERS, before COVID-19 restrictions have been fully lifted leaving small businesses to deal with post-pandemic recovery alone. CEWS is being replaced by uh, the Canada Recovery Hiring Program that Ms. Jaffer referred to, or CRHP, but it does not cover pay for employees on paid leave, uh, putting both small businesses and employees at risk. Small, small businesses still need support, and the Green Party will make sure they have it. We will ensure that all new legislation considers the impact on small businesses. We will reduce bureaucracy and streamline approvals for small and medium enterprises, SMEs, uh, to adopt technologies. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, Paige, your minute and uh, 15 seconds starts now. Yeah, I think uh, the most important thing is not what, you know, the Liberal government has done wrong, but what the Conservative government will do right. So uh, once the Canada emergency wage subsidy ends, uh, Canada's Conservatives will introduce what we are calling the Canada Job Surge Plan. And the whole purpose of this is to get Canadians back to work. So uh, when Aaron O'Toole uh, forms a government, he would pay at least 25% of the salary of net new hires for six months after the Canada emergency wage, wage subsidy ends. So we have a plan to transition away from the old program to a new program entirely focused on jobs and supporting small businesses because they are a key source of employment in local communities like New Westminster and Burnaby. Um, so that is the plan. And for those who have been in, you know, unemployed in a long term, we will be covering up to 50% of the salaries for those who have been unemployed. So if it's going on for a long time, we will have your back and small businesses we are there for you as well. We also have our Main Street um, program and the whole purpose of this is to provide tax credits and benefits to small businesses. Thank you, Paige. And thanks everyone for the um, responses to the first question. We'll come to the second question now. And uh, Rosina, I'm gonna to come to you first on this one. 
And this is in the area of uh, the environment. Um, for many, the impacts of climate change were really brought into focus this summer. Around the world, we've seen record floods, hurricanes, and of course, uh, locally here in BC, devastating wildfires. What do you think should be the focus for the next federal government in terms of addressing climate change and mitigating its effects on people, the economy, and our communities? Your minute and 15 seconds, uh, Rosina, starts now. Thank you. Yes, indeed. We have to not only get back to normal, we have to get back to a new normal. And that means we have to get back to a recovery where we are actually, I mean, the climate change actually poses us or gives us excellent opportunity to reinvest money in opportunities for clean energy. It allows, we are going to be allowing investments for clean investments. We are going to be encouraging businesses who want to support a clean environment. We're going to be supporting them with money. We're going to be supporting them with innovation. When we transition out, we want to transition to a cleaner economy. And part of that, this, in fact, as I said, this offers us a great opportunity because businesses are finally waking up to the fact. They're finally realizing that climate change is real, that there is an economic incentive to climate change that wasn't perhaps wasn't recognized or there before. Now they're re recognizing that incentive. And, you know, when I hear Mark Carney say, talk about, um, you know, the uh, business of Canada and working economically with the, with the business sector and climate change. I Thank think you, Rosina. You, you've got a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Rosina. Uh, next up, um, Peter, we come to you next. Uh, thank you very much. Well, the, the sad reality is that Canada actually has been the worst among all major industrialized countries in terms of the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. So Mr. Trudeau has talked a good line, but he has not delivered. Quite the contrary, we've been going backwards. And we know the impacts of climate change on individuals. We lost 700 people this summer because of the heat dome. We also know that the incredible Im implications for businesses. And the economic cost last year alone was $5 billion that will be considerably increased this year. So what we believe needs to happen is the following. We have uh, to eliminate the oil and gas subsidies. These are massive payouts that, that simply do not serve to provide the supports and transition to a clean energy economy. The Trans Mountain Pipeline I'm opposed to. Uh, on the financial grounds, the PBO indicates it will never make money and the massive public subsidies are simply not worth it. Providing supports to retrofits, providing supports to clean energy vehicles will make a huge difference for the economy and particularly in Burnaby gives us a, a, a great number of opportunities for local businesses and local jobs. And so that's the shift, the transition that needs to take place. Thank you, Peter. And uh, next up on this question, uh, David, we come to you. Your minute and 15 seconds starts now. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Um, Lord Stern, a member of the House of Lords in Britain, did a uh, study decades ago uh, that estimated what the cost would be uh, to us uh, internationally, the cost of climate change if left unchecked. Um, it was in the billions and at the time people were blown away by the numbers. Um, billions were inconceivable amounts at that time. Today we're talking trillions and the longer we wait, the higher it'll get. Um, as you can guess for the Green Party, uh, climate change, it's a very major issue. It's my primary issue. Um, and we have multiple pages in our platform that deal with um, climate change. I just wanna talk about green infrastructure because I think the business community would probably be most interested in our ideas in that vein. Um, we would develop a national renewable energy electricity grid, ensuring that 100% of Canadian electricity is produced from renewable sources by 2030. We would create a national coast-to-coast-to-coast -to -coast -to -coast energy corridor for re green renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Paige, we come to you next. Your minute and 15 seconds starts now. Uh, so I think, you know, there's this false idea that we have to choose. We either have to address climate change in the environment or we have to support the economy. Canada's Conservatives say 
No, we have to make a plan to address both in a coherent manner. So right now, under the Liberal government, we're not on track to meet our uh, emissions reductions targets under the Paris Accords. Uh, Aaron O'Toole has a plan uh, whereby we would meet our targets by reducing our emissions and at the same time fight to make sure that workers and small businesses are not being thrown under the bus. And a lot of this is going to come from creating the right incentives. So that means incentives to innovate. We want to have green hydrogen, we want to have carbon capture technology, and we want to responsibly develop the LNG industry because we know that LNG is much uh, cleaner burning than coal. This is a necessary transition fuel. So that is our plan. We want to actually meet the targets that have been set, meet those uh, agreements that we have, and at the same time, support economic development and workers. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. And uh, Kevin, uh, for the last one on this question, we come to you. Minute and 15 seconds starts. Uh, so basically, the People's Party of Canada, we're looking at the environment. Uh, the amount that Canada put, contributes to global warming is very minimal. Uh, we're looking at more or less a carbon tariff on countries that have high pollution. As a result, it would reduce global uh, pollution levels across the board, as well as in, uh, incentivize uh, innovation in some industries. Um, as far as like green energy is like Germany went all wind and solar and their greenhouse gases shot up hugely. We need a very robust energy network for any uh, projects for energy generation in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks everybody for your responses on that question. And the next one I'm gonna come on to, um, and on this one, we're gonna start with you, Peter, uh, is in the area of childcare. Uh, for many years, the Burnaby Board of Trade has argued that childcare is not simply a family issue or a woman's issue, but an economic issue, allowing more parents to join the labor force and helping women in particular to fulfill their economic potential. What is your position on the role of the federal government in addressing the dual challenges of both finding childcare spaces and then making them affordable for families. And Peter, we'll start with you and your minute and 15 starts now. Uh, thanks very much. And I'd like to thank the Burnaby Board of Trade for its advocacy on this. Uh, Childcare is uh, not only an important social program, it also has economic benefits for every dollar invested in childcare. Uh, there are many dollars uh, that are unleashed in the economy. And so it's, it's one of these uh, issues where when you make the investment, it's a win-win, both in terms of the quality of life for families, but also in, in terms of the economic benefit for the community. And so I'd like to shout out to the, the BC NDP government that has taken the lead nationally on childcare. Uh, the NDP for many years has talked about childcare as being of the utmost priority. Uh, we've now seen the Liberals start to move in that direction, but given how many times they've broken promises solemnly. Remember in 2019, the solemn promise was PharmaCare. They've not delivered. Uh, what we will continue to do, whether we're in government or in, in another position in the parliament, that's up to Canadians to choose. We will continue to fight uh, for childcare and childcare agreements that provide supports to families right across this country. It is simply good sense. Other countries do it. Canada needs to follow best practices. Thank you, Peter. And uh, next up for this question, then we come to you, David. Thank you. Um, the Green Party would dedicate additional resources to make making a universal, affordable, early learning and childcare system a reality. And I put an emphasis on the early learning aspect. We would collaborate with provinces and territories, local communities, indigenous communities, and the childcare sector to ensure that a comprehensive, short, medium, and long-term policy roadmap based on the principles of universality, affordability, quality, inclusivity, accessibility, and equity finally becomes a reality. These principles will ensure a right of access for all children, regardless of their parents' work status or income levels while at the same time allowing for regional and local adaptation. We will improve and strengthen parental leave, make parental leave more inclusive so it covers leave to care for elderly fam family members, leave following marriages and more and more flexible and better paid. 
Finally, we would increase federal child care funding, immediately begin to ramp up federal child care funding to achieve the international benchmark of at least 1% of GDP annually. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Paige, we're coming to you next, and your minute and 15 seconds starts now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I think the issue is that the both the NDP and the Liberal plan have sort of a government knows best mentality when it comes to childcare, whereas the Conservative Party says that actually parents know what be what's best for their own families. And so our childcare tax credit system actually puts more money back into the hands of parents empowers women to choose whether or not they want to participate in the workforce outside the home or within. And that's a family-centered decision that each individual unit will make. And, you know, we have to have enough respect for individual families to let them hold on to more of their own money and make those decisions for childcare. Um, I think that's essential that parents are in the driver's seat. And we can't afford more of an inaccessible system where we just have promises uh, and no delivery. So I think that's the main thing is we're going to speed up this process by making it a tax credit system, empower families and individual women to make the choices. And that is how the Conservatives will approach this issue. Thank you, Paige. And now we come, um, Kevin, to you on this one. Well, basically, early childhood, um, it's important for child development. The People's Party of Canada, we're looking at actually just reducing the cost of living. If cost of living goes down, people have more money and they can invest in the child's future, how the parents and the family wants the child to develop. This is important for not having to rely on a third party, say the government or any charity, for that financing for that child's development. Uh, cost of living is too high in Canada. We're having a housing crisis in many cities. It's gonna have to be a very broad solution to tackle just a simple issue, unfortunately. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And um, finally on this question, uh, Rosina, can we come to you? Thank you. Um, we've had a lot of interest here and I, as a woman and working force, we have the whole idea of ma making sure that we have childcare and the economic issues of childcare. I like the way you first began by saying that it's not, it's not just a women's issue. It's not just a social issue. It's an economic issue. And I'm very, very committed to making sure that people understand that, that they understand that keeping women out of the participation of the workforce is very, very, detrimental to the economy as a whole. So that's one point. Second point that I wanna make is that we're working towards the $10 childcare, as you've all heard. Uh, Deputy Minister Christopher Freeland has gone on and on about it. We have a plan out there. Mr. McDonald's um, criteria that he mentioned, the, four, the, the quite well laid out criteria, accessibility and, and affordability are very, very important. These are criteria that we wanna make sure is in an early childhood learning system. I hate to disagree with Ms. Monroe. I don't think this is, <laughs> but I think it's really important to have a childcare system where we have someone that has a standard. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for your responses to that question. Um, the next area I'd like to come on to, and on this one, I think we're coming to David first. Uh, and this is in the area of housing affordability. Uh, a top concern of Burnley businesses, big and small, is the cost of housing. For them, they see its impacts on the labour force as it becomes harder to find workers as they have to live further afield, and those that they can find need higher wages to afford housing. The middle ground of housing, supports for working class middle income Canadians, is a priority for us at the Burnley Board of Trade, as these people are often ineligible for many housing supports due to their income levels, but are still not able to find housing easily at full market value. What do you think can uh, be done or should be done to address the housing affordability challenges in Burnaby and across the Lower Mainland? And uh, as we mentioned, David, uh, we're coming to you first. Your minute and 15 starts now. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Um, addressing the affordable housing and homelessness crisis uh, takes up four and a half pages of my platform. 
I'm going to just cherry pick through it uh, to try and give you some uh, components that I think your members will find interesting. A green government would declare housing affordability and homelessness a national emergency. We would redefine affordable housing using a better updated formula that accounts for regional variations across the country. We would immediately appoint the federal housing advocate as established in the, housing, in the National Housing Strategy Act, but I gather that is currently vacant. Something that might interest um, British Columbians in particular is that we would strengthen regulation to limit foreign investment and ed end predatory practices in residential real estate. We would raise the empty home tax for foreign and corporate residential property owners who leave buildings and units vacant. We would assess the role of real estate investment trusts or REITs uh, in Canada's housing market. We would close tax haven loopholes, which allow foreign investors to hide the names of beneficial owners of properties in Canada. And we would crack down, of course, on money laundering in Canadian real estate. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, next up on this one, we have Paige. Uh, your minute of 15 starts now. Yeah, thank you very much. So housing affordability is one of the major issues that uh, Canada's Conservatives are trying to tackle, and this is going to come from three main things. Right off the bat, we want to have a foreign buyer ban. If people are not purchasing property because they're going to be a part of the Burnaby community, that's a problem because the market needs to reflect the economic capacity of the people who are actually living there. The second thing would be to actually increase the supply of not just single-family homes, but rental units. So we want to incentivize much more purpose-built um, rental properties, as well as build 1 million homes over the next three years. And part of this is going to come from actually releasing real estate to make that land available. So uh, Aaron O'Toole's government has an extensive plan to actually release at least 15% uh, of the federal real estate portfolio to open up space for houses um, to be built. So. This is absolutely crucial. I hear it every day when speaking to people. I'm a renter myself. I think a lot of people uh, feel this squeeze and we have a plan to tackle it. Thank you, Paige. Uh, Kevin, can we come to you next, please? Uh, sure. Uh, People's Party of Canada, like I said before, we're trying to reduce uh, the cost of living. Um, one thing we've noticed is uh, I think the Liberal government is planning to bring in 4,000 immigrants. This impacts the housing and rental market hugely because if we do not have the capacity to house them, then we're having competition and the landlords and people selling can set the price at the highest level they can think they can get. And without reducing immigration and developing housing in our nation, we are not going to be able to tackle this. And that's why People's Party of Canada is actually looking at it from a bigger picture. What are the things that are affecting the housing market and how, what we can do to actually minimize the problem? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and uh, next on this question, uh, Rosina, we have you next. Thank you. Thank you. Housing is a very, very big issue. And the Liberal Party believes that every Canadian deserves a safe and affordable place to call home. I think that we, um, young Canadians, feel that we, finding a home and affording a home, and especially buying one, is going to be out of their reach. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be saying, uh, talking about the own to home, owning a, a home, and giving young Canadians under 40, $40,000 towards the purchase of a home. That is, that is one thing that we're going to be doing. We're also going to be looking at renting to rent to own so that people that are currently renting can also look at having uh, the rent to own market. We're also going to be looking at the real estate market. Undoubtedly, the real estate market right now needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of work. It needs to be corrected so that it doesn't exploit Canadians. And we need to make sure that that's done properly. 
all of that has to be done to make sure that people can afford a home. As far as immigration is concerned, I just wanted to say that, you know, when I, 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 you have to also remember that immigrants are also the ones who are going to be staffing your businesses. So while yes, it's okay to say, well, we don't want immigration because of housing, because it's house to housing. <laughs> it's also the immigrants that you need to, to deal with your labor shortage. I, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Rosina. Thank you. Um, Peter, uh, can we come to you finally on this uh, question, please? Yes, th thanks very much. And, and I concur with my liberal colleague. Uh, Burnaby is a welcoming community and uh, I, I didn't like those comments at all. I will say uh, that for so many businesses, the lack of housing affordability is a huge problem. And in the last six years under Mr. Trudeau's government, the average cost of a home has gone up $433,000. That means uh, that uh, it's simply no longer accessible at all. So what has Chuck been saying and what has the NDP been saying on this? Well, first off, uh, we are going to go back to what was a, a, a winning formula after the Second World War and have the federal government actually providing affordable housing, working in partnership with co-ops, nonprofits and municipalities, using federal lands and making sure that we can build a half a million affordable housing units. That's what we did after the Second World War. Uh, we need to do it again. We also need to ensure that we are cracking down on foreign ownership the money laundering that is taking place that is, is uh, not being reined in in any way by the Liberal government and house flipping. And we have a Liberal candidate in Vancouver Granville that has been involved in flipping houses, making millions of dollars. These are the kinds of things that will lead to an affordable housing supply. And we need to act now. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And thanks everybody for the, the responses on that question. Um, we'll come on now. This may be the last question. We'll see how timing goes. We might be able to squeeze one more in afterwards, but we'll come on to this next question. And we're going to be starting with Rose, with uh, Paige on this one. Um, through its impacts on healthcare and the economy and through the cost of support programs, the pandemic has cost the federal government hundreds of billions of dollars. What are your, th what are your thoughts on how this specific bill gets paid in the future? And more broadly, what do you think is the appropriate role of government spending in the economy? And to what degree are you concerned about the level of deficits and debt in Canada? And we'll give you a minute and 15 starting now. Yeah, I actually take the debt very seriously. When I was at McGill, I was uh, with a nonpartisan group actually called Generation Screwed that uh, was very much focused on looking at the debt and considering how basically the can is just being kicked down the road. So not even me, it would be my children or my grandchildren that will end up having to pay this bill. And, you know, when you have a prime minister that just sort of flippantly says, oh, I don't think about monetary policy. For me, that's just like red sirens going off in the background. So um, to get to the point, Canada's Conservatives have a plan to balance the federal budget within the next decade. We don't want to do it just like that because that would be irresponsible, but we do have to get on a plan to get you know, in the black, as it were. And part of that has to do with, again, creating the right incentives. So instead of just government spending you know, hand over fist, we actually have to look to businesses um, and say, maybe we can provide some strategic loans, a portion of which may be forgivable based off revenues, or maybe we need to provide tax incentives and a combination of the two. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, let's come to you next. Uh, so basically, the role that government has in the, is setting up trade agreements with countries and facilitating import and export of resources and products. Um, as far as like set, setting up like loan programs and all that, the government should have a minimal hand in that. So as to have the company be able to establish themselves, relying on themselves to be able to produce themselves into the future. If they're, if they're like dependent on like the government for any subsidies constantly, the business is going to fail. What we need is a robust uh, industries to support the Canadian economy. Otherwise, we are not going to be getting an economy that can support Canada's population. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, we have uh, Rosina. Thank you. 
this is, a, again, a very important question about that concerns both economic policy, Keynesian economic policies, as well as monetary policy. We're looking at government spending and the risk to government of government spending. The issue is, you know, when you, I as a citizen spend, and let's say I borrow to make my ends meet, that's a bad, that's a no. I shouldn't be borrowing money to make my ends meet as a citizen. And as a personal person, a person, I don't do that. I don't live out of my means. However, we have a situation here where the government, had, and again, I come back to, to, Kinsin, uh, to economics, Kinsin economics, where in order to grow the economy, in order to be able to get people through something, you have to be able to increase government spending. It, is, it was the government that took on the debt and the government took on the debt because households shouldn't have to. We're looking at spending a lot of money that had to be spent to keep people afloat. To, without a minimum income, without a minimum float, the economy would crash. And that's what we had to do. And that is why we did what I did. We did. Thank you, Rosina. Thank you. Next up on this one, then, Peter, we come to you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, the result of the last uh, decade or more has been that Canadian families actually have the the highest family debt levels among all industrialized countries. So we have not seen either conservative or liberal governments act responsibly on financial uh, ma financial management. Now, uh, the NDP has costed uh, its commitments and through the parliamentary budgetary officer, we can now compare the three major parties. And if, uh, what we find is Jagmeet Singh and the NDP actually has the lowest deficit, lower than the liberals, lower than the conservatives. How did we do this when we are talking about uh, strong spending and investments to help regular families. Well, we did that by actually putting in place a fair tax system. That means putting in place a wealth tax. And countries like Norway and Switzerland already have that in place, making sure companies that have benefited during this pandemic actually pay their fair share of taxes and eliminating the subsidies like those that go to the oil and gas sector that cost Canadians so much. And in, in doing so, we can make these investments that make a difference in people's lives including public universal pharmacare. And so we take the issue seriously and we actually have the best balanced plan. Thank you, Peter. And finally on this question, we come to you, David. Thank you. Um, for the Green Party of Canada, it's all about transitioning to a green economy. Um, and the uh, benefits that will be afforded in that that will go on for generations. Um, just a couple of points already alluded to by uh, Mr. Julian, we will cancel all new pipeline projects beginning with Trans Mountain. That alone will save us some $5 billion. And when I say some $5 billion, uh, that amount of saving is only likely to go up. Uh, the project is presently 25% complete. It's 50% uh, uh, of the capital budget has been spent. So you know they were gonna increase uh, that capital budget yet again. We will also cancel all, all uh, uh, subsidies to fossil fuel sector. Uh, that last year alone, direct and indirect, amounted to some $18 billion. Um, with that $23 billion that we would be saving, um, I think we could do a lot to invest in renewable energy and put people to work in the renewable energy sector. Um, I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. And I think we can probably squeeze one more question in. I'll, I'll just give you a minute each on this one so that we can um, get, get one more question in. Um, inflation in Canada uh, was up 3.7% year over year in July, the biggest increase in a decade. Uh, for businesses, the cost of their inputs and raw materials are going up. And uh, we've been speaking a lot recently about the impacts of, of uh, shipping costs and container costs on, on that particular area. And in turn, eventually the cost they charge consumers must increase too. And as costs for consumers increase, that puts downward pressure on discretionary spending and upward pressure on wage costs for businesses. Uh, what are your concerns about inflation and the general cost of living in Burnaby? And what is your message to voters who are finding the cost of everyday life going up? Uh, we'll start in the order we, we began. So, Kevin, we'll start with you first, and you've got a minute from now. Um, so, basically, inflation is a major problem 
uh, the uh, rampant spending that the federal government has done has only accelerated it because we have that huge deficit now that we have to pay off. If we can't pay off or balance the budget, we're going to have inflation even worse in the future. What we need is to actually start tackling the budget, get it balanced, and start making it so that people have more money to spend so the economy can uh, bounce back even better. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Rosina, I have you up next. Okay. Yes, inflation is scary. Monetary policy is scary. Um, we have put a lot of money into the economy, and that means that we're worrying about supply and demand. The demand for products is, has increased while the supply has remained stable or uh, shrunk. As that demand and supply catches up, inflation will catch up. We will get inflation back under control, but we're going to take a while to do that. It's going to take the economy getting back into its own court. Canada hasn't had inflation for years and years and years. We were, worried, we were so worried about the depression that we, in, in fact, allowed the inflation to happen, and we will get that inflation back in control. It's not a dirty word. It can be handled, and it, can, it will be handled. But we have to realize this simple economics in terms of the supply and demand and how that impacts uh, in, and how that impacts uh, inflation. Thank you. Thank you, Rosina. Um, Peter, we have uh, you up next. One minute, please. Th th thanks very much. And yes, it's a matter of concern. The increasing cost to businesses is, is another challenge that businesses in Burnaby are facing. Now, what, what the NDP has proposed is it's things like uh, capping interchange fees. Uh, credit card companies are gouging local businesses, and the federal government simply has not stepped up. And the NDP government simply would. Would. And when we talk about cell phones and data plans, Canadians pay among the highest prices in the world because the government is simply not inclined to set any limits to, uh, to the big three. And what, uh, what an ADP government would do, as other countries have done, is cap uh, those charges. Uh, the other element that will make a big difference for Burnaby businesses is public universal pharmacare. Businesses across Canada pay about $6 billion in drug plans. The competitive advantage would be about $600 per employee to have public universal pharmacare rather than the hodgepodge of plans that businesses are obliged to, to buy right now. And so these are ways that we can reduce cost to businesses. Thank you, Peter. Um, can I come to you next, David? One minute, please. Please do, Mr. Holden. And uh, I'm going to narrow my comments on uh, uh, inflation to... Um, uh, something that the Burnaby Board of Trade uh, brought to my attention in preparation for this talk, and that is the 400% increase in the past several months um, for container traffic, uh, container shipping. And you might wonder why an environmentalist would be in any way drawn to this particular topic and this particular element of inflation. Uh, I noticed that one of the Burnaby Board of Trade's uh, recommendations is expediting assessments of the current and future port capacity and supporting increases to our trade infrastructure capacity. Um, this will surprise you, but um, an environmental group reached out to me uh, early in this campaign, um, the South Islands uh, group, um, where they have freighters, uh, uh, transport ships, uh, harboring and uh, running their engines Clearly, the Port of Vancouver needs to be updated and upgraded. Thank you. Thank you, David. And um, finally, to help us wrap up today, uh, Paige, can we come to you? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, one of the key things that the Conservatives are focused on is our recovery plan, and that involves a robust economic growth plan for Canada. We have to get our financial house in order or everyone is going to suffer. It's going to be small businesses and it's going to be families, it's everyone. So, you know, again, going back to the deficit, if we don't start getting this under control, then inflation is just going to continue to be a problem. People's money that they've worked so hard to save, the value is going to be less of that. And then their grocery bill is going to be higher. Their utility bills are going to be higher and they're going to have less financial power to actually pay for it. So we have to adopt a responsible and measured approach to balance the budget over the next decade 
and control inflation so that Canadians are more economically empowered with the money they have. It has to retain value, and this is essential. Thank you, Paige. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today for this really, really insightful and important discussion with the local candidates in the New Westminster Burnaby riding. I'd like to thank all of their candidates, not just for your time today, but also for putting yourselves forward uh, as candidates in the federal election. Public service, uh, service is a really important part of our society, and I commend all of you um, for stepping up to, uh, to offer your services. Um, I also encourage everyone to get out and vote. You can vote at your assigned polling station on election day, Monday the 20th, and polls will be open for 12 hours on election day. For more information on how you can vote, you can call 1-800-463-6868, or you can visit elections.ca. Thanks again uh, to our five candidates here, uh, A, for, step, for coming in today, and B, for stepping up uh, to offer your services uh, to, to, to your communities. Uh, we really appreciate you doing that. And uh, I know you've got lots and lots of door knocking and other activities to do for the rest of the day and the week. So uh, good luck with all of that to all of you. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you.